Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, three, two, one. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good afternoon and happy new year, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Shriver Space Power Series. I'm Kevin Chilton, Explorer Chair for the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence. Just a few short weeks ago, we marked four years since the establishment of the Space Force. And since then, the service has made great progress in strengthening its day-to-day -day capabilities and pursuing ambitious long lead concepts. To discuss the state of today's Space Force, we are happy to have Lieutenant General Deanna Burt, the Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Operations, Cyber, and Nuclear. General Burt's extensive experience and leadership at all levels of space operations make her uniquely qualified to set the scene here with us today as we kick off 2024. So with that, General Burt, I'd like to offer my warmest welcome to you. Thanks for coming to join us. We've been trying to make this happen, I think, for about six or eight months now, but life and operations get in the way, and I'm so glad that you're our our first guest to kick off the 2024 calendar year. And with that, I'd like to give you the opportunity to offer any opening remarks to our audience. No, sir, thank you very much. And thank you to the Mitchell Institute for this opportunity. I think, uh, as you said, going into our, we just finished our fourth birthday, heading now into our fifth year. It's been really exciting to be uh, a guardian from the beginning. Uh, and there's been a lot of growth. Uh, I think what we've continued to work through and now as we move forward in our fifth year is really continuing to drive on what we call our theory of success, competitive endurance. Uh, and it has three pillars to that. One is exquisite space domain awareness. How do we ensure we know what's in the domain, uh, good, bad, or otherwise? Is it suspect or hostile, patterns of life, how things operate? And also for the safety of flight of our own uh, capabilities, working with our civil and commercial partners. Uh, and then number two is knowing what is on orbit. And if we can attribute, how do we make sure we're working through our own resiliency uh, to avoid those threats when possible? And also to have uh, the ability to take a punch if required. If, if an enemy or a potential adversary were to take out a capability, uh, how would we absorb that uh, and continue to keep fighting through that? So you've seen us work through proliferated constellations, uh, things that we're moving forward on in the future, uh, working with our commercial and allied partners to build resilient capabilities working together uh, in similar mission sets. Uh, I also think that includes cyber uh, and how we uh, reinforce our ground uh, and communications networks as well, because we need that resiliency. We expect fully, as we saw in Ukraine, that could potentially be one of the first attacks that we see. Uh, and lastly, as part of that theory of success of competitive endurance is if required, uh, we can take a punch, but if required or asked to, to offer options to the National Command Authority, how would we do responsible counter space campaigning? Uh, doing that away in a way in the norms uh, that we've agreed to across the international uh, arena with our partners. Uh, doing that not in a way that we would trash the orbit. By no means do we want to see uh, war extend into space, but if it does, we have to be prepared to fight and win. Uh, but do that in a way that doesn't disadvantage all the other uh, players that operate day to day uh, in the domain. I think it's very different in space as compared to other domains. Uh, if you look at the airspace over Ukraine, you can see a very large hole where because fighting is going on, they've cleared the airspace and no aircraft are flying into that area. You can't really do that in space uh, because of the way the orbitology works. Hmm. Everyone is in the weapons engagement zones depending on uh, how those things play out. So again, how do you do that responsibly uh, and provide options uh, if asked? So I think working through those three pillars uh, over the next uh, the coming years are what we're trying to get after. We've stood up, we've established, uh, we're in a good place. And now it's really, as the General Saltzman talks about, it's about delivering. Uh, and I think the force is ready uh, and we're moving out in a very positive direction. So I'm just proud to be here today and happy to talk about what we've been up to. Great. Well, this is perfect because you just that introductory uh, bring some questions to mind and some new capabilities that I'm just learning about that I'd love to hear you talk about. Uh, the standup of a new squadron, the 75th Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Squadron. This mm -hmm. is an, a new operation, I, I assume, and, and it seems to me that it is important to at least the first two pillars, if not all three. Could you tell our audience uh, a little bit about the 75th and their responsibilities? Absolutely. The 75th uh, ISRS is a new squadron within Delta 7, which is our intelligence delta. Uh, that primarily is working uh, target folders and targeting uh, for the uh, all domain architectures 
with primarily the focus on space targets. So when you think about space targeting, you think about all of the architecture that involves. You and I know of having worked in the space business, when you look at something, if you're trying to take out a space capability, it involves the ground, the satellite, and the receiver, and the inner, uh, the electromagnetic connections between those, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the fiber and cable that connects all those things to be able to talk to each other. Also, the eyes of the potential adversaries and how they would see our capabilities if they chose to try to take us out. So how do you look at all of that? Um, the goal with the 75th is also part of normalizing as a service with a warfighting domain. Every service has targeting squadrons or targeting elements that focus on targets within their domain. Uh, as you know, in the past, different folks have tried to fill this void and need for target folders and targeting information or target quality information. Uh, now that we've established this squadron, I think we now normalize with the rest of the world uh, and the other domains. I think the other piece of this uh, for the joint force that's important is these are target folders that are like all the other target folders for all the other domains. They're available to all of the intel professionals that are out there. So when we start talking about in any given combatant command, a war that could extend into space or in their combatant command, how would they pull targets? They'd pull them from the standard targeting database. These would be space targets that are maintained and kept current by the 75th uh, and would provide them the information they need. Uh, we also talk about that every space target does not require a space answer. This is an all domain fight. So some of these may be actioned by cyber, kinetic, non-kinetic. Uh, there could be bombs on target if they're terrestrial targets as we talked about that ground infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So again, being able to put that whole uh, foundational intelligence and target, targeting information so that you can get after weaponeering and campaigning uh, is what we're looking for. And the 75th absolutely provides that capability. You got us. it. And so <clears throat> I guess I was assuming it was going to be more of a, <clears throat> excuse me, space domain awareness mission set, but actually the organizations and the people doing the domain awareness are going to be in su supporting, absolutely. supporting this organization absolutely. as they develop target sets and target folders and packages, which I gather you want to make them as normal as everybody else's so mm -hmm. they can be nominated up to the combatant command and prioritized and targeted. Yep. So I think that as you talk about, sir, that space domain awareness capability brings, as we talked about in competitive endurance, is what is that pattern of life? What are the normal things that satellite mm -hmm. does? What are its mission sets? How does it operate? What tactics, techniques, and procedures have we seen them uh, operate in day to day? And so all of that would be captured day to day by the space domain awareness architecture from our surveillance and reconnaissance intelligence for space that's then shared. And the 75th is capturing that as part of a target folder to say what is normal, what is not normal, and how is that then captured if you chose uh, to action those targets. And it's not just the space threat, space on space threat you're yes. worried about. So if, if an adversary has a ground-based laser yes, system sir. or if they have a, a transportable direct ascent ASAT system, um, these folks would be identifying them through some other so ISR work. squadrons work that say, hey, there's a, a tell there that's just come out of out of hiding. And now they, they build a target package and nominate it to the commander to address to protect the space asset. So it would, it would include that type of work as well. Well, the addition, in addition to the 75th, we also set up the 76th Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Squadron uh, last year as well. And it is a fusion engine to bring all source intelligence together that would then again be part of how do I capture that uh, in a target folder uh, to then be used uh, for weaponeering and targeteering. Overall, to all of that, we all stood up, also stood up Delta 15 last year, mm -hmm. which is the C2 element, which is most people know is the National Space Defense Center. That's the Delta from a Space Force organized training equip providing to that joint center to be able to do the C2 of, of all of this, what is hostile, what is suspect, what's going on in the domain, keeping that common operational picture utilizing both what the 76 Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Squadron is doing from a fusion perspective, what our space domain awareness sensors are bringing together, mm -hmm. uh, and then how does that all become actionable in those target folders that the 75th uh, would then maintain. Got it. So space domain awareness includes terrestrial domain awareness mm -hmm. of threats to space. Yes. And and so that's, that's going to be required as well. Um, U.S. Space Command has said, you know, space domain awareness is one of their top priorities or, or needs to be filled, uh, which makes sense for any combatant commander who wants to know what's going on over the hill or hold down over the horizon mm -hmm. beyond visual range. How's that going? It, 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 do, you, do you feel like the Space Force is, is able to meet their needs and growing in the right directions? Uh, we're definitely moving in the right direction. 
Uh, we've put invested $35 million uh, in our space domain awareness capabilities. Uh, we continue to grow that. Uh, but we also look externally, what capabilities have we already built? So the dark radar, we're looking how do we connect that uh, to the modern uh, databases so that we can share that data because we expect it to be uh, a very rich data source for space domain awareness. I'm sorry, dark radar. Help, help me with that. So the dark radar is a phased array radar that we're looking at deploying uh, multiples of around the world. Again, I won't get into specific sure. locations at this time, but uh, that's uh, a capability that as we continue to develop and build out the capability uh, with uh, our partners, because Australia is one of the partners working with mm -hmm. us on this, how do we get uh, that connected to what we call the unified data library so that data is available across uh, all of our capabilities. I think some people don't really understand that unified data library. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multi-security platform that allows us to store data uh, so that you can pull data from commercial, from the military at different classification levels, but it's a storage in the cloud that then allows you to pull that to do multi-source uh, space domain awareness uh, looks at various uh, things in the domain. So I think it's important as we build out the unified data library under the leadership of Warp Core out at Space Systems Command, how we continue to build that uh, capability to not only include what we do as the Department of Defense, but as we talk about uh, our commercial partners, we've seen a lot of growth in the Joint Commercial Office uh, hmm. out at U U.S. Space Command. So an effort there to bring in joint partners, or co I'm sorry, commercial partners, uh, to actually bring their data. So there's a lot of uh, work being done on radars uh, and telescopes on the commercial side of the house. How do we leverage what they are seeing in the hmm. domain? This also helps us as we work closer with the Department of Commerce as they bring on their civil flight safety capabilities. So that database would allow everybody to have access at the appropriate classification uh, out of the UDL, the Unified Data Library, to do that. Uh, JCO has been, the Joint Commercial Office has been a really great growth area also with our partners. The United Kingdom just stood up their own uh, Joint Commercial Office as well. So now as the sun goes, so will the Joint Commercial Office and we'll be able to have a 24-7 uh, capability working with our allies uh, on that. So I think the future, not only with what we are building and investing in space domain awareness, but what we're also leveraging from our commercial and allied partners uh, is absolutely moving in the right direction for a shared understanding of what's going on in the domain. One of the big challenges in the past was everybody used different data formats, and we were we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to build a translator, if you will, so mm -hmm. that the UDL can be updated from all these different sources. Have you have you solved that problem? Well, I would say the technology has solved it for us. Yeah. So data translation is not as hard as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so now uh, we do have some data formats and most folks do operate within their own standard data formats, but uh, they're not as many as you would think. And by putting it in the UDL and making the data discoverable, uh, folks are able to much more quickly build their own translators uh, to pull that information. But we found that that technology has actually uh, come to bear that those translators are not as difficult as they used to be. That's great. So at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is being able to provide a common operating picture that depending on your clearance level, you get certain levels of access to the big picture, if you will. As every domain has a copy exactly. that allows that, that exactly. level of different layered data. Great. Now, you also mentioned the uh, U.S. Space Command working with commercial uh, capabilities. Uh, space Systems Command also has a commercial office. Commercial Space yeah, Office. Can you talk a little bit about what your expectations there from Space Systems Command are? So we are days away, hopefully, from signing a commercial strategy, which the CSO will sign. Uh, that commercial strategy takes into account this commercial space office. How do you have a front door within Space Systems Command for all of the commercial entities to come to, uh, to be able to talk about what the Air Force or Space Force needs from a GAPS perspective, uh, where we want to see new technologies, how can we help influence each other? They've had uh, industry days, they've had reverse industry days where we talk about GAPS and they hear us, and then we've had industry days on particular topics where they come back as industry and offer what they have available uh, and what technologies look promising that they're working on. So I think the, the back and forth and the dialogue continues. I think the other part of the commercial strategy that we have to work through is servicing. How do I buy something as a service versus buying a new capability. So mm -hmm. again, working with commercial to, to build a satellite or a rocket or a thing is how we've historically worked. How do we start to think about buying things as a service? I don't have to own the satellite. I don't have to own those things. I just write a contract and buy a certain level of service from you, uh, I think is what we're trying to also make sure we capture in the strategy and how do we get after buying some of these capabilities, particularly something like SATCOM as a commodity, rather than I've got to own and operate the entire satellite. Well, we've always flexed into the commercial SATCOM belt in crisis because yes, in the past we never 
head and up downwards. Yes, sir. Um, and we continue to do and so. And do that now. Uh, do you see that also in the um, ISR optical imagery? I mean, we've got Maxar and people out there that are commercial companies that take pictures of the earth. They, they, have, they produce a product. You don't have to own the satellite, but you can buy their product. So that's oh. another another a, uh, avenue. Is that Absolutely. Uh, ISR is one we look at from the commercial antiques, and more and more of those are growing, as we've seen heavy use mm -hmm. uh, in the Russia-Ukraine uh, fight we have going on. Uh, Ukraine has leveraged commercial quite a bit. Uh, so we see the value in that. The same is also said for GPS or navigation sources. Are there other alternative PNT or precision navigation and timing capabilities uh, that could be available to us in the commercial arena? So uh, I think everything's on the table and, and that's what we want, right? Every domain has an industrial base that supports mm -hmm. them. Uh, the space domain has not necessarily had a very large base uh, in the past because again, the cost of entry and typically it was primarily the government running uh, those capabilities. Now that you see uh, entrepreneurs and commercial uh, going into the domain now and more nations are also spacefaring nations, you're starting to see that industrial base start to build. Uh, so in our interest, I believe we should allow, you know, the work in every domain and every gap that we have, because the more we build from an industrial base, again, it goes back to that competitive endurance. I have more resilience because I have an ability to fill a gap if it's taken out in combat. Perfect. Great. I'm going to shift gears for you now. Okay. A lot of people don't think about the importance of space, our space capability to missile warning and to, you know, um, just national security with regard to our peer competitors, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, how important missile warning is at the strategic level. And certainly, uh, I think we learned even back as far as Desert Storm, how important it is at the tactical level. And we started seeing scuds shot into our bases in Saudi Arabia during that conflict. One of the systems out there <clears throat> called JTAGs that was a theater-based system. I remember the Army was operating it when I was on active duty. But I understand now this has come under the auspices of the Space Force. Can you talk a little bit about why, why that transition was done and what benefits you're seeing from that? Absolutely. The, uh, the Joint Tactical Air Ground System, or JTAGs, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, was run by the Army. There are four detachments. So you have Japan, Korea, Qatar, and Italy. Uh, we have absorbed those, the, both the mission and the authorities and the acquisition through uh, one October last year is when we took all that on. Um, as we've worked through, the Army has been an incredible partner <clears throat> as we've done this transition uh, to seamlessly bring it over. As you said, there, the missions are a little different. We've stood up the 5th Space Warning Squadron, which oversees those four operational detachments overseas. Uh, it is a one-for-one -one swap, guardians to soldiers. So again, there was not a plus up in manpower. This was just a change out. Yes, we did offer uh, members that were in this mission the opportunity to be uh, inter-service transfers. And again, some took them, some not, did not. But regardless, we one for one filled guardians into those positions. Uh, we will have soldiers with us until April of this year. Uh, and then they will with, you know, it was do no harm to the soldiers in place, let them naturally attrit. Uh, from that mission set and to, again, bleed every bit of information because honestly, they've been doing this mission for decades. Mm -hmm. How can we get the most from them? So they've been amazing partners. They transition out in April and this will be fully Guardian led. Now, why that's important in the Space Force is, as you said, that is a tactical theater mission. So they are still using the space based infrared system, which is a Space Force system, but they only look at the satellites that they can see in particular for that theater. Whereas the second Space Warning Squadron, which is a historical space unit that's been around for decades, does a global look using space-based infrared systems. So the fact they're on the same, looking at the same satellites and have the same software, we're now normalizing the acquisition between the tactical to the strategic global look. Mm -hmm. But what's more important, I think, that we've seen since 1 October is the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are being shared. You have experts that are talking about the theater's needs and the theater's concerns about missile warning and threats as compared to then what does that mean to the strategic look is they're trying to balance uh, coverage across the globe uh, to support all the combatant commanders. So I think it's been a great marriage of sharing of information and ideas. The other piece is when it was in the Army and you had the Space Force, the only place where those two organizations really came together was at the Combined Force Space Component Command, or now what we call our Space Force Space Component to U.S. Space Command. Mm -hmm. So day to day, the JTAG's operator was not really tracking constellation outages, things happening at the ground system, or with any of, of the antennas that were outside of their theater. Well, now they're getting that view and they're being proactively talked to now 
by the unit because they're all together mm -hmm. about what is the status of the constellation. And we've actually seen some great wins where the JTAGS operators like in some uh, recent operations giving direction like, hey, if you moved it slightly this way, I get better cover. So they're able to now talk directly to each other that we're all in the same organization. So I, I think we're only going to see this continue to improve our missile warning uh, capabilities, both strategically and tactically. Excuse me, does it help with resilience at all for the missile warning? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, because yeah, now you have antennas effect. around the globe that continue to draw down Sibir's data, uh, and how can we create that resiliency and in the architecture that if the MATRA control station goes down, we do have COOP capabilities. Uh, so basically the ability to pick up and go to our backup location. Uh, but you do have those downrange as well, so you don't lose that coverage if you were to lose the master control station. And the JTAGs are mobile, correct? Yes, sir, they you are. Can pick them up, move them to wherever you need them. Yes, sir, you can. Great. What about um, Space Development Agency is planning a LEO constantly? I think the future I've heard is being considered as LEO, MEO, and GEO missile warning capability to improve resilience mm -hmm. and maybe timeliness of, of track boarding. Um, does JTAGs fit into this architecture yes. as well? Okay. So the existing ground infrastructure that we have will absolutely utilize anything that SDA uh, is building out as we move forward in the future. So that has always been planned that way. Okay, good. So there won't be any interface issues there. No, sir. Perfect. Um, let's go to launch. Just recently, I saw in the paper uh, this thing called Victus Knox. Okay. Not quite sure what that means or translated, but I know it was a, uh, a rapid response demonstration. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, what, why are we looking at this? Um, what you've learned from this first experiment or demonstration and where you hope it is going to go? Oh, absolutely. The, I think that the important part for any domain is how and part of resiliency in that, that second pillar of com, uh, competitive endurance is how do I build resiliency if I take losses? How do I quickly uh, fill those gaps? How do I quickly reconstitute? Every domain has that mm -hmm. reconstitution look. Uh, so rapid space operations or resilient space operations allows us to do this. So this resilient launch, I think what's unique about Victus Knox, this was a demonstration to look at how could we look at our processes and how we do business from the, the no kidding, go build and acquire a satellite that took 12 months, put it, which is much faster, as you know, from normal. your time than, yeah. than we normally do. Mm -hmm. How do we then put it and made it to a rocket from the time it's told to go and launch to getting it on orbit? Those were all done in the matter of days mm -hmm. versus in some cases, those, as you know, with our other systems have Years. taken quite longer. Yeah. So I think this has been a good, really good first look to allow us to scrub our processes, look at where we have choke points, things that we can do to improve because it's about speed. Uh, to be able to quickly get that capability reconstituted. Uh, I think really as we move on, the next version is called Victus Hayes. Uh, they're in the process of the down selects now to get ready for that demonstration. I would expect we'll see that in a right now program for FY25. So we're moving toward the next one. Uh, I think the goal every time for this is to get faster at this. I think we all though recognize working with Honorable Colvelli, getting after those tenants of acquisition. Mm -hmm. How do we shrink that acquisition timeline for the satellite being built? And that's always been our goal is to speed up acquisition and to get to capabilities that we can quickly launch. Um, I think there are different ways to look at it. Is it storage? Uh, we've had issues over the past with very exquisite satellites. When you store them, they're, uh, they're finicky and they don't always do well in storage versus trying to pull something commercial off the shelf very quickly to fill a gap. How do you do that? So I think we're trying to find something that's the sweet spot between those two that can shorten that 12-month timeline. Yeah, the, the satellite side of it. There was always uh, operational response to space is a, is a concept that's been around for a yes, long time. What was always lacking with a con ops and a, a dedication of resources to address the various things you just described, whether it be the satellite manufacturing, integration into a launch vehicle, on orbit activation of the satellite, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds like you're kind of knocking those pins down one at a time. And that the current long pole in the tent is what you described at the end here is how long it takes you to put a satellite together. But you, I think I read where 27 hours after you said launch, the thing went off the pad. Yes, sir. Which is very impressive on the launch side and the integration and, and the activation side was quick as well. Yes, it was about 37 hours. Which is unbelievable. Yep. Uh, no, it, it went very quickly. Like I said, it was very impressive to watch uh, the team execute this and they did an excellent job. Again, a very great first look, but again, we're 
we're always looking to be faster and better. Great, great. I hate acronyms because they, you know, I, I used to love them because I knew them all, right. but I don't know them right. anymore. So I'm going to ask you a tough one here. What is what is SPA for Gen? And help our audience understand what that is and what why it should matter to them. Okay, SPA for Gen is Space Force Generation Model. So it's basically what is our readiness model uh, to force present to a combatant command? So in the past, uh, when we were in the Air Force, mm -hmm. uh, we force presented very similar to the way the Air Force is. I don't know if many people know there is are two tools that Congress by law requires us to purport readiness in. It's called sorts and DERS, and don't ask me those acronyms because I won't remember those. But sorts and DERS are the by law mandated ways to report. The Air Force uh, reported uh, those capabilities, their capabilities are largely deployable. So as a space mm -hmm. component or the MAGCOM, Air Force Space Command at the time, we were force fitting ourselves into that Air Force model with a primarily employed in place mission. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really capture uh, all of our capabilities. So now as we've become a service, we've established our own Space Force input tool, which is now our tool to report to Congress by law. Oh, that and, meets and the requirement. Congress changed the law to allow for this, to but, allow to you report? Well, sir, I think the law is written very generically that every service will report. So it doesn't uh, identify any particular tool. It's you have to use this particular contract and then build your tool to how you're going to portray your readiness. Got it. Okay. Now, why space, space Force generation model is important is how am I force presenting to the COCOM, and then how do I measure that in my readiness? So in the Space Force Generation model, you think about employed in place forces. In a benign environment, operators were just running crew. When I was a youngster, we just ran crew, six on, three off, and that's all I did. I never made time for advanced training to think about the threat, to think about campaign planning, to go down range and work exercises with other service components. I just didn't get to do that. All I did was just keep working crew. And there was really never a thought of being in a contested environment and how would I operate that way? Well, now that we recognize that, how do I create the white space for the operators to be able to do that? So we present a combat squadron. I wanna emphasize that a combat squadron includes operators, cyber professionals, and intelligence operators. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna ask me the question about integrated mission deltas. It also now includes sustainers and those two pilots. So that is a combat squadron that is force presented to the combatant command, whether that be primarily U.S. Space Command for our employed in place missions, but for the handful of deployable capabilities like space electronic warfare, those could be presented to another combatant commander as they deploy downrange in their commit cycle. Mm -hmm. So there's a commit. I'm committed to that combatant command, and that is all I'm doing. When I come out of commit, I go to prepare, which is now I'm taking leave. I'm, I'm working my medical, my personal things. Uh, and as I come into ready, I'm now doing that advanced training, that bigger thought. I'm playing in space flags or other exercises. I'm doing advanced training on the threat and my weapon system, a deeper dive. I'm becoming an instructor, an evaluator, other certifications that I would need to then go back into that commit phase again with my crew. Mm -hmm. And so that cycle continues uh, throughout. And that's how we are then modeling our Space Force input tool to present readiness uh, of how that whole both the people, the training, the threat, and the equipment are measured to do that cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's why Space Force Gen is important to us. Great, and our, not just at the squadron level, we will also be doing it at the command and control level. Yes, sir. So out of Vandenberg, so you'll actually, I mean, one of the frustrations I can remember in the past is people always wanted to have space people, other combatant commands wanted to have space play in their award game. Well, there was no excess capacity or time to do that because they were having to operate all the time. And in fact, the only equipment they operated with, they didn't have training equipment where they could go off to another, if you will, AOC or space operations center that's that's the same as the actual online one, but allows them to, you know, simulate warfare, et cetera, et cetera. And, that. and so I'm hearing that that's kind of the vision, even at the at the operational level of war, to be able to provide opportunities for the operators when they're when they're, they have this time off from sitting console and doing day in and day out missions to train, exercise, support other COCOMs, war games, et cetera. So I think what's unique about space as compared to, so if you look at any C2 element, uh, if you go to the KOC mm -hmm. in in uh, the Middle East, they don't support anything but mission there and they're never rotating out of that. They're, they're constantly just pulling shift. They're doing C2. We see the same thing for our two 
centers, both uh, Del-5 mm -hmm. and the Sp Combined Space Operations Center and Delta-15 with the National Space Defense Center. We see those same two. So we see C2 happens constantly. So we don't see them necessarily in a space or gen model. Where the things you're talking about, when I need a space operator to play in my exercise or war game, they're coming to us for space uh, planning teams that we are just now starting to develop for each of the co-comps. And they're going directly now to their service components. As you know, we've stood up for... Uh, we just set up our fourth service component. So that's where they would reach as a COCOM to their space capabilities uh, that are now resident in their own combatant command and their own component space component uh, to play in those war games or to play in those exercises. We as a service are building those space planning teams from the staff and from other uh, forces to be able to offer those training opportunities when folks are in prepare or ready to be able to go down range and participate. So we're really not going to the C2 center and putting that on them the way we have done in the past. We are now building that C2 capability forward to be able to participate uh, and play with those co-comps directly. So you envision some authorities to be chopped forward to the combatant command and not reach, reaching back to Vandenberg. Yes, there could be authorities, uh, deployable capabilities, things that have only regional uh, effects or capabilities. Absolutely, that would be discussed and, and would be presented as part of the, the GFM process, the, the Global Force okay, Management sure. process, which is the joint process of how we present forces just like any other service. Well, while we're talking about components, um, you stood up Indopaycom and UCOM. Not sure if there's any other ones you've stood up yet, but I think the intent is for to have one at every terrestrial combatant command headquarters. Uh, how's that going? Oh, it's going great. Uh, so the first year we stood up, as you mentioned, Indopaycom. Uh, we stood up Central Command, uh, Space Scent. We also stood up Korea. Uh, and then this just last December, uh, we stood up uh, Space uh, Europe, UCOM, URAF. So it's Europe and Africa uh, Command. So great organization uh, that we just stood up. Uh, we've seen all of the service components, the amount of uh, integration and work. So uh, we started with what was our director of Space Forces staff. So when we were in the Air Force, mm -hmm. we had director of Space Forces in each of the air operations centers. Uh, we've used that in some cases, at least in the first four, as the nucleus of how we then built to a component. So that became like the, the nucleus and then started to add capability to that till we could get to a service component. I want everyone to understand the process to become a service component. It's not a willy-nilly thing. It has to be a, a want on both sides. The service... Um, the combatant commander has to say, I want a service component, and there is a formal letter that he or she writes to the SECDEF. Mm -hmm. uh, the SECDEF then comes to the service, and the service says, yes, yeah, verily, we are ready, uh, and here's the timeline that we will now work with the combatant command to execute that service component. There's then mission analysis work done about the mission of that combatant command, what expertise and what mission sets best apply, and what does the service component need to look like in size and scope uh, to do the mission and get resourced. And so now we're building through that. So now that we have the first uh, four stood up, uh, I think we're in a good place. There are more that absolutely are coming. Um, we will take those on as the combatant commanders make those requests for those uh, capabilities and, and we'll continue to move out. But it's a, it's a two-sided thing. It's not just we want to go build service components. The combatant commander has to be ready because again, you know, on your end as a former combatant commander, I've got to re I've got to put a pl where am I going to sit them? How am I going? Where are they going to be? How am I going to set up my C two now in the combatant command mm -hmm. now with a service component? So they have to really want it as well. It can't just be us uh, pushing it. But I can tell you from the first four, the amount of integration and where we've gone uh, in the last year, I got lots of people calling and yeah. knocking on the door of how to work the process. I can't imagine them not wanting space support yes, directly in their headquarters. Um, it kind of begs the question on Manning: Is that going to be something? The Space Force has to take out a hide, or are you going to ask for joint billets? One of my one of the great frustrations in the past was that at the JSPOC, the Joint Space Operations Center, if you looked around, they were all airmen, mostly, mm -hmm. and because we could never get the joint billets. So we, we the Air Force had to take those positions <clears throat> out of hide. Um, is there a, 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 is the Space Force advocating for more joint billets so that they can get more manning to do some of these joint missions? So if you look at any uh, service component, uh, they are all typically built by the service that is the service component. Mm -hmm. If you go into the CFAC uh, at Al Udeed, you will see liaison officers from the other services. You'll see uh, folks that come from the Army and you have your, your BDD, BD, BCD cell that's working uh, missile warning, missile defense kinds of things, or, or uh, missile defense for the theater. That's because of the CFAC in his joint hat 
his or her joint hat has that missile defense responsibility for the AOR and has been delegated that authority. Mm -hmm. So joint other service folks show up to your center to do that C2, but those aren't joint billets. General Saltzman schools me on this regularly. <laughs> those are all service billets. So when we stand up a service component, we have to come forward with the billets. So yes, we are proposing how do we grow those? How do we present those in our POM submissions uh, to fleet up and continue to fill out those service components that will also impact uh, how quickly we can establish more. Because again, I don't want to establish something that I can't resource or get to the right level for they so they can provide support to that combatant commander. So uh, this is going to be a how do we grow and grow at a rate that we can grow by manpower along with all the new mission uh, that we have coming as well. So uh, I think it's a balance there of how many we can take on and how fast, but uh, definitely want to grow, as you said, to all the COCOMs over time. Great. That makes sense to properly resource it with yes, the, right, the right number of people. You you brought it up, not me, integrated mission deltas. Let's let's talk a little bit about that because it's new. And I think a lot of people are still trying to understand what they are and how they fit in. No, integrated mission deltas really revolves around uh, unified mission readiness. So to be able to be the commander that's re in charge of reporting something from a readiness perspective, I need to be able to control all the levers of that readiness. So in the past, as commanders in the Space Force have reported on readiness, the one thing they don't have authorities over or control over are the sustainment arm of their weapon system. That reports through Space Systems Command. So in these two pilots, we did one for precision navigation and timing, so GPS. The other one is space electronic warfare. Uh, we picked those two missions, GPS, that is an employed in place mission, whereas space electronic warfare is a deployable mission. So it made sense that we could get a two pilots, that we could get a different look at readiness and mm -hmm. how they would report. So now as the commander of either of those mission deltas, integrated mission deltas, I own the people, I own the training, I own the sustainment, and I am ultimately responsible to report and manage all that. So that meant we co-located or, or assigned the sustainment elements of parts of SSC to the mission delta. Okay. Uh, in one case, we have a uh, material leader leading the GPS integrated mission delta. In the case of the space electronic warfare integrated mission delta, we have an operator leading and their deputies are the opposite. Mm -hmm. So we keep that vision of both uh, the sustainment and ops are working together. You have an intel squadron, a cyber squadron, and the operational squadron and the sustainment squadron in that integration, integrated mission delta. So all the things you care about for your mission are in under that singular commander to be able to move and control and make decisions. So we're getting this pilot going. Uh, we've been going since about the second week of October. We're going to continue to evaluate. We're due to go back to the to General Saltzman uh, in the March-ish time frame. Uh, and see what we've learned. Mm -hmm. And are we willing to continue on to more pilots or adding on more mission sets? Uh, but that's to be seen as we get the readout of, of how they're going. We have seen some, some really good wins. Uh, when you get acquirers and operators working together for the same boss mm -hmm. and you're rowing together, uh, in the past, again, I'm not saying we didn't work well with our acquisition partners. We did, but it was more personalities based. It wasn't structurally based working to the same boss mm -hmm. for the same capability. Uh, mission set. So it, I think that's what's important about this. And we've seen testing on new capabilities and new software move faster. We've seen the operators integrate quicker uh, with changes and offer uh, pain points to the sustainers and the sustainers are there right there with them and understanding and moving much faster uh, than we've seen in the past. So again, it's not that those things weren't happening. It's just the speed of, of being responsible and putting it all in one mission delta is what's made uh, the magic kind of happen. And so we'll see how it goes, but uh, it's looking very promising as so, we stepped out. If I could pull on that a little further, it, it seems to me in the Wayback Machine, which wasn't that long ago, at the squadron operations a lot of the SOPs, say GPS, that if there was a technical issue with the Constellation, you, you knocked on the back door in the SOPs and it was all contractor support. Mm -hmm. um, is this more of you knock on the back door or you don't even knock on the back door, they're in the room with yes, you, sir. of uniformed guardians who know the system as well as the contractors used to know, know how to fight the system, know how to support the system. Is that is that the division? I would say it's a mix mm -hmm. of military and contractor, depending on the weapon system, but they are absolutely there. So as you remember, uh, I was a former two stops commander. Mm -hmm. um, when I had a problem, I would call what we called level one or level two maintenance. 
level one maintenance sat there with me mm -hmm. uh, every day. But again, they reported to Space Systems Command. They did not report to me as the squadron commander. Right. Level two, the next level of maintenance, some of it sat near me, but a lot of it sat back in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, my ability to action and work deeper problems, I had to go further away. Well, now if I say this program of record is now the sustainment element, how do I take all the sustainment that was with SSC and now I combine it with this integrated mission delta? So I'm not what now that what we will call the systems deltas, the SYDs, will be focused on the future GPS development, capability. Development. Yeah, Whereas yeah. now the sustainment, once you say it's at a certain point, and that's part of the pilot is determine where is the sweet spot to transition it from development to uh, operations mm -hmm. or sustainment. And so where is that? So in this case with the P, with uh, two SOPs and the GPS integrated mission delta, we gave them OCX. So they not only bring all Which the sustainment, the ground, that's the ground, the ground element and all of the the satellites that are on orbit that are mm -hmm. programs of record. But what happens is, is now when that capability comes over, you get not only the people, but you get the budget and the things that all are part of that sustainment to now action that capability uh, and to work your problems. And so you have the people, the, the sustainment and the training all in one house of all the parts you need for the mission set. So. Uh, it's almost like the Air Force is one base, one boss discussion, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's putting all of the readiness levers under a singular commander. Great. Thanks for explaining that. I think yes, that's sir. very helpful. Um, uniquely, the space domain is is really, it's really the only war fighting domain where the operators aren't present in the domain. They have to control everything remotely in that domain mm -hmm. uh, from the terrestrial domain. Um, and you do that through networks, either uh, electromagnetic, you know, dish to satellite, or as you mentioned earlier, cyber through the ground. Can you talk a little bit about the threats and how you're um, posturing the command to be resilient in that part of the space domain? I agree. Uh, I think we're working across all aspects. As you mentioned, there's a ground, there's a satellite, and there's a receiver element. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about the cyber pieces to all three of those. What that really requires is cyber professionals sitting side by side with operators and intelligence professionals getting after a particular mission set. And we call that our mission defense teams. And so they're there in the squadrons uh, working on our operational systems. We've developed uh, tools that we put onto our weapon systems to be able to detect cyber intrusions and when things are going wrong with the system. Uh, we're trying to build that to an enterprise look because, again, we fully expect you're not going to get attacked in one place. You're going to get attacked in multiple. Mm -hmm. So how do you get an enterprise view uh, of what your cyber vulnerabilities and threats are and how do you operate and fight through those as part of that resiliency of competitive endurance? The, sec the last thing is how do you bake that in from the beginning? So how do you build this cybersecurity mindset in uh, into the acquisition process, and then you have the human on the loop uh, working it from the mission defense team perspective. Again, an enemy keeps voting, so even as much as you can bake in, there will be things that, that evolve and change based on the threat. So the human on the loop is actually uh, quite valuable because you're never going to be able to bake it all in mm -hmm. from the beginning, but at least you make the best effort, and now you have the, the humans in the loop. So I think all of that of trying to get after an enterprise view with professionals who know the key cyber terrain for their mission because they're embedded in that combat squadron and mm -hmm. talking about the readiness and how they fight every day. I think that's gonna be the key to us continuing to move forward and to continue to build out those mission defense teams across uh, our entire portfolio. Uh, and how, how does US Cybercom, I know this is maybe more a COCOM question, but how does US Cybercom participate in supporting um, the defense of our space assets and our space capabilities. So U.S. Cybercom is actually uh, an incredible partner and that they're providing, obviously, we're, we're clued in uh, through our Delta-6, who is our cyber lead for working uh, all these things across the enterprise. And they have those cyber, del cyber squadrons across each of the mission deltas. Um, absolutely tied to Cyber Command about how do we talk about threats, what's going on, what is Cyber Command seeing, uh, both threats out in the commercial world or even on our own systems and forward what intrusions are being made not only to our base networks, uh, but to other systems. So that intelligence sharing continues with U.S. Cybercom. U.S. Cybercom is really about the cyber mission teams that are presented. And so you will see cyber protection teams come CPTs, come visit our capabilities 
and do assessments of our vulnerabilities. Well, when they come and there's an MDT there, a mission defense team there from our side, there's a great exchange of information of, hey, this is what we saw in your system. Here's what we see. So there's an exchange of data. So I think from a cyber protection team, they are absolutely looking at mission sets within the Space Force. Those are prioritized, by the way, by US Space Command of which systems they want them to come see from the combatant commander's perspective. But then once they come out with us interacting and taking those deficiencies or any write-ups and how do we work those together and within the service uh, to get after the funding and resourcing of those. So I think there's a great relationship there. As you can imagine, Cyber Command, we've had conversations about do we have a service component uh, to US Cybercom. Uh, we don't have currently any guardians uh, at Cyber Command, uh, but we're looking to in the future, how do we, do we get after that? Because we do recognize that cyber is, is critical to us. Uh, I would say it's on the order of gas to the Air Force, cyber is to the Space Force. I cannot do my mission without cyber. Uh, as I like to say, there are no space heroes without ones and zeros. <laughs> so I, it, you, it is a, a definitely a relationship that we see an importance to. And I think down the road, you'll see a growing relationship uh, and force service component with U.S. Cyber Command. Yeah, and we'll just, just now we're just mostly talking about defense and protection. When we talked about the 75th earlier and their job of nominating targets, certainly cyber could be the tool used to go after a, an, an adversary target as well. So there, was, there would be a relationship, I assume, for on that side of the coin. Yes, well. I think uh, every service provides cyber mission teams. Uh, when we originally stood up uh, the Cyber Mission Force and Cyber Command, uh, absolutely, I think the service long term is looking to that. Uh, first, we need to fill out the mission defense teams across all of our own capabilities uh, hmm. before we would start to pursue that. But I think we do see that uh, down the road in the next 10 to 15 years, we would actually be trying to put together uh, a cyber mission force or contribution as a service to that. And and our goal would be to support U.S. Space Command in that. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, who better to defend or to attack enemy capabilities in space than those who've, who critically understand it and work it every day? I think that makes sense uh, long-term to be the cyber teams that would be presented to U.S. Space Command. But again, that's a long-term goal, mm -hmm. uh, stretch goal. We, we still have to get after our mission defense teams and, and fleshing all of those out across the enterprise before we would start to pursue that. Okay. Well, one last question before we turn to our audience. And General Shaw, who just retired after a great many years of service to the space mission, he, he talked about the ability to have guilt-free maneuver capability. In other words, um, we always worry about fuel consumption in space because there are no gas stations up there. And if you want to maneuver, you have to weigh the satellite mission life versus that maneuver. Um, and so as, as you think about refueling capabilities for the future to allow for a little more flexibility or perhaps uh, new sources of, of energy for maneuver, whether it be uh, nuclear propulsion or, or whatever technology out there, uh, any any thoughts in that area about or any ideas or concepts that you guys are working on? No, you'll hear us uh, talk about that as dynamic space operations. Mm -hmm. So the ability to maneuver without regret, as you talk about, I think is absolutely part of uh, our theory of competitive endurance with that resilience capability, right? If I know I can run without regret or maneuver without mm -hmm. regret, as General Shaw mentioned, and I can get gas, I, I can outrun you. If I can't and I run out of a consumable, then you you technically functionally kill me. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've run out of gas. Right. Um, so I think those are important and in every domain, they're important. Uh, one thing I had a conversation uh, just recently about, why did the Air Force go to tankers? And it was really about the strategic, and you're very familiar with this from your STRATCOM commander time. Right. It was about Curtis LeMay and the bombers trying to get mm -hmm. uh, as part of the triad over uh, with the Soviet Union. And that's why they came up uh, with the tanker concept. Uh, now we've used tankers for everything, mm -hmm. but that was the initial piece of this. So again, as we look at this from a space perspective, what are the missions? And again, I think this uh, being able to maneuver without regret. Uh, we've talked sometimes, and I've heard General Shaw say this too, you know, gas for geo and below is un it's good to have, and it would be as the threats grow and ability to maneuver without regret, but gas beyond geo will be absolutely required. So as we talk cislunar and other uh, missions in the future. So I think it, it definitely is evident this capability is needed. The next question becomes, how do you deliver it? And so as you mentioned, there's technologies like nuclear uh, and other ways to do this. Uh, do you do this as a service? Do you buy this capability or do I buy it as a service yeah, right. on the commercial yeah. piece? So I create space gas stations mm -hmm. or space gas trucks. What What is your model and how do you get after that? I think that's what we're trying to determine is what is the the most efficient way to get after that uh, in a way that gets us the capability as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, the other piece, and I, and I just throw this out from a 
a protection perspective, if I can reach out and touch you, historically, we've said those are also things that can hurt you. So yes, I may be a tanker uh, and a refueler, but is there a perception that I am something else nefarious and how I operate? So again, getting back to norms of behavior and how do you normalize uh, servicing or refueling or those kinds of things? And are they seen as very transparent and done in a way that everyone understands? Yeah, that's just a refueler. That's that's nothing uh, nefarious. I, I think we're going to have to figure out working with other countries and allies and partners. How, how, how do you do that in a way? And again, maybe commercial is an answer because then there isn't a a stigma that it's a DOD capability. I also truly believe the commercial companies are going to want that gas too. So it's not just- Oh, they already yeah, have. Yeah, already, it's not they're already using it. Yeah, they're already working yeah. their way to it. So yeah. so I think it's it's definitely something we need to, to continue to look to and we've got to figure out how to resource. Right. And and you mentioned cis-loaner. I mean, it begs for a, a nuclear propulsion, hmm? nuclear, at least power generation capability to then use that to, to propel vehicles for long periods of times over great distances and you're not constantly launching to to refuel. Agreed. So great. Well with that, we're going to turn to our our audience on the on the internet out there. Thanks for the discussions. I'd just like to remind our, our audience that if you have a question, first unmute your mic, a mistake I always make. And uh, <clears throat> and please identify yourself and an organization if you're affiliated with one. And Aiden will will review the questions and forward them to us. Uh, so Aiden, if you're ready. We're ready to take your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first, we have a question from Teresa Hitchin from Breaking the Fence. Hi, um, thank you for doing this, uh, General Burt. I appreciate it um, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I wanna go back to the first issue you talked about with the 75th uh, Squadron. And I was a little confused about the interaction between the 76th and the 75th. Could you just elaborate on how their mission sets are different and how they interact with each other? Thank you. No, great question, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, the seventy fifth is building uh, all sort is building targeting folders uh, across a space architecture uh, that would include the capability to, from an all domain perspective, uh, take down an enemy capability. So, what I, or adversary capability. So, what I want you to think about is the ground, the satellite, or the receiver, and the connections either through the electromagnetic spectrum uh, or through uh, cyber or fiber connections. What does that whole architecture look like, and how would you target that capability? And that could be done from air, land, sea. Uh, and someday in space. How would you go after all of that target architecture? Across the Joint Force, there are standard target folders and they're digital that include various things that allow you to look at where best to strike and with what types of munitions and what probability of kill. And I could go on and on about all the details that are in a target folder, but it's a very standardized process across all domains. That's what the 75th is focused on, but doing that for space targets or space threats. As uh, General Chilton mentioned about ASATs and ground-based lasers and other capabilities, they're pulling that data together in a target folder that's information to any combatant command. Should they want to attack that target network because it's a threat in their area of responsibility, here's how they would best target it. And they could nominate those targets to a targeting board at the combatant command. Now for the 75th uh, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Squadron, that unit is an all-source intel unit that's fusing together intelligence across the board about threats, uh, space threats, whether it be from SIGINT, HUMAN, IMINT, all those things, and very focused on space threats alone, and how do I publish data and fuse data together to then present. Some of that would be captured by the 75th as we learn more uh, about these threats in the target folders that the 75th is creating. But this is really to pull all of that information together in the 76th, such that it can then be used uh, by other intelligence entities, uh, or just to better educate us on the way it works, or if actionable, how does that then get documented and tagged in a target folder with the 75th? Hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. Great. Ne next, we have a question from Courtney Albin of C4ISR.net. She asks, the DAF has been conducting a readiness review across the Air Force and Space Force. What has your role been in this process and what insights has the review provided about Space Force's readiness? readiness? Absolutely. We, uh, thanks for that question, Courtney. We, we've talked a lot about readiness uh, for great power competition. How do we prepare 
uh, and ready uh, for the fight that could come to us uh, with our pacing challenge uh, and how do we deal with that. And so that's been a lot of readiness discussion. As I mentioned earlier, our key piece of this was one, getting our own readiness reporting tool, two, getting into the Space Force generation model that I talked about to get after employed in place and how we rotate through a commit, prepare and ready phase to best have our forces ready and to also train folks in a threat informed environment against that pacing challenge. Um, putting all of that together helps us move forward uh, in readiness. I think some of the things we're learning about employed in place readiness are absolutely transferable to the other services. So I want to think just in, within the DAF alone, you have ICBMs, you have cyber, um, you have uh, the DCGSs, the intelligence capabilities that are the ground-based systems uh, that the, the Air Force uses. Those all are employed in place models as well. So I think there are things we are going to be doing in the Air Force and, and Space Force and learning that will be transferable to the other services uh, for their employed in place missions. Again, their amount of employed in place mission is much smaller than ours. They're more uh, deployable and go downrange, uh, but there is absolutely uh, some transference there between the Space Force uh, and the Air Force within the Department of the Air Force. So a lot of great learning going on. Uh, I think we're learning we are continuing to grow as a service, uh, only four years old. Uh, we've got to continue to keep building capability and building capability in a space superiority mindset to get after the training uh, and readiness capabilities that we need. So uh, I think we're all uh, driving in that same direction in the Department of the Air Force, uh, but the Space Force more coming, only being four years old, coming out of that benign environment to a warfighting environment, we have a lot more lift uh, to do than, say, our Air Force counterparts. Next, we have a written in question from Jerome White. Mr. White asks, as we partner and integrate and increasingly leverage commercial partner capabilities, they will potentially be exposed to adversary threats. Is there a certain level of protect, defend responsibility that will be expended to them, extended to them? And conversely, are there any standards and policies that we would expect as a government customer to have them provide? No, that's a great question. Uh, so we've been doing this uh, for decades, at least I have, and I know General Chilton's played a few too. It's called Shriver War Game. Uh, and in these war games, commercial partners have played with us. We've had commercial partners uh, since 2015 called the Commercial Integration Cell as part of the Combined Space Operations Center out at Vandenberg. So we've had commercial partners playing in these war games with us and interacting uh, over the years. And we've had this very conversation about threats. Um, from a commercial provider's perspective, you have two views. One is, yes, I have a large DOD customer base. Uh, I want to be on the side of the DOD of the US. And therefore, yes, if I'm that important to your mission and it's important to protect me, please do. And then you have others who say, no, I would like to be agnostic and not pick a side because I have customer base on, with both of the warring entities, whoever they may be. And therefore, I don't want to be protected and I don't want to be seen as picking a side. Uh, those are all conversations uh, that we've had uh, in those war games. I think now as we continue to move forward and as we've seen commercial used in, uh, in the Ukraine conflict uh, and what has happened, there's been a, a significant uh, growth in the use. How do you write contracts that say, hey, if I have capability on board your satellite or I'm going to buy a service, as we talked about, how do I write that contractually in a way that there's a certain standard of you're going to ensure me delivery and that if I need to defend you or there becomes an issue where I need to defend you, that you're willing to work with that? When we talk about what's defended and what's not defended, I want to be clear that I explain uh, the joint process of how that's determined. That's United States Space Command. United States Space Command is a combatant commander, owns the area of responsibility from 100 kilometers to infinity. So in that area of responsibility, what does the US Space Command commander determine is the critical asset list. That critical asset list will be what General Dickinson as the US Space Command commander believes is critical to his mission. But then the other combatant commanders, depending on the fight, would also be nominating things to the critical asset list that they would care about. There could be situations where those things uh, are in conflict with each other, and then that would get adjudicated working with the joint staff of how we would uh, adjudicate between a COCOM, uh, US Space Command, and another COCOM. But ultimately, in the end game, there would be a critical asset list created. Then from there, what is the capacity to defend, and how would I prioritize those one to end for a defended asset list? So. Capacity and capability to defend would also defend how many things get defended and in what priority. So 
as we move forward for the future, where do those commercial capabilities, to your example, where do those commercial capabilities fall on that critical asset list? And where do they fall then on the defended asset list based on what capacity and capability we have to defend? Uh, so those will all be considerations as we move forward in the future. But I can assure you uh, in wargaming and in exercises, uh, both with U.S. Base Command and other combatant commands, those conversations are happening uh, in our games. It's hard for me to imagine that um, a U.S. company wouldn't want to be defended. Uh, I mean, I think about what the Houthis are doing uh, in the Red Sea right now. I haven't seen any any uh, cargo ships saying, no, don't please don't defend me against no, against these attacks. Is it, I mean, um, I understand business, but I also understand warfare. And if, if uh, asset is critical to U.S. Department of Defense and it's a U.S. contractor. It's a flagged U.S. satellite. If you will. let's let's go down that that route. You know, a flagged U.S. commercial ship. Or, or is the Space Force going to defend them? Well, I yeah. think what's I I, I want to be careful when we talk about this because when I think yeah. it, it gets very um, interesting. So I'll go to to the recent example in Ukraine. So in Ukraine, I was the when the war kicked off, I was the Combined Forces Space Component Commander out of Vandenberg. Mm -hmm. And one of the discussions that we had was, as you know, the U.S. Uh, put in demarches and said, hey, these are uh, sanctions that we do not want you to sell certain things to Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, part of that was satellite communications and different uh, satellite and commercial capability. Right. Each company had to make a decision. And so none of these, even if it's a U.S. flag spaceship or a spacecraft, it may have subsidiaries in different countries. So some of these companies had U.S. subsidiaries and they had subsidiaries in Moscow. Their choice was, do I keep that subsidiary open or do I close it as a result of these? Because they would face penalties for their subsidiary in the sure. U.S. So again, those are all business decisions that each commercial entity has to make, which is why I don't think you can just carte blanche say everybody's going to want to be defended. I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. But I think for us as the department, how do you have to how do you document that in your contractual agreements for servicing and for critical capabilities? If you're going to rely on them as part of that resilience element of competitive endurance, then they have to be willing to do certain things. And so I think that's what's going to make this commercial space office, our commercial strategy, how we map that out with the in, our industry partners and to actually codify that uh, in contractual relationships, I think is because you don't want to be guessing that. When the, when the when fight the starts, up, right? That's right? And so I think that's that's work we have to do. Great. Thank you for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this Space Power series. Uh, thank you again, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Burt. Just a great conversation today. I hope it was educational for our, the rest of our audience. It certainly was for me today. And uh, great progress the force has made over the last four years. And I'm sure 2024 is going to see the ball move further down the field. So from all of us at MI Space, I want to wish all our participants today a great Space Power Day.